Wonderful Wednesday in the Word. Happy, elated, glad, and thankful we are for this opportunity to share like faith from God's holy book, the Bible, in an effort that we will all become more like His Son, Jesus to Christ. Thank to you, you, and especially you, for joining us again as we walk through the Word on Wednesday night. Continue to pray, those who are members of the Southside congregation. We have so many things going on uh, this weekend. It's last the leaders at the Rosen uh, Plaza, Rosen Center Hotel. Uh, of course, next month we have the uh, uh, minister uh, will be uh, leading a program to honor our deacons uh, and their families, our elders and their families. That's respectfully. May 21st and for the deacons and May 28th for the uh, elders and their families. Uh, we'll have a 9 a.m. program on both of those Sundays, segueing us into 11 o'clock worship. We're asking all of our members uh, for those couple of weeks to make a sacrificial trip out for the program phase to honor these men for their work sake. And then on the uh, May 29th, our traditional Memorial Day weekend, we'll have our Shepherd's Feast, our annual cookout that we've been not able to have that for the last three years because of COVID. So we're looking with tiptoe anticipation uh, for a big month in April and May. And then hopefully we're still trying to get participants, students and chaperones, kids to go to the Southeastern Youth Conference that will be in uh, uh, Statesboro, Georgia, June 12th 
through June the 16th. Uh, we want to get a bus if we can, if we get enough people to go. So just uh, those who are interested or may be interested, please contact Melanie Williams or Linda Adams and we'll do what we can to make sure all that who want to go can go uh, for this function, this opportunity for our youth again. Pray one for another. Much continues to go on at the Southside Congregation, but we know God is faithful. I heard the preacher say, I believe his name was Wesley T. Leonard, uh, God is able. That was two weeks ago. And uh, I think many people were encouraged by that. Uh, and then uh, on this past Sunday, my hope is in God I, and in this encouraging mode uh, for us to put our faith, our trust, and our confidence in the God we serve. Tonight, let's continue on this exhaustive study. I continue to encourage you not to be weary in well-doing. We're going to keep looping around the preacher, the minister, evangelist, and then we segue into the elder, the bishop, the shepherd, and then we go to the deacon. We'll be doing that for a while, uh, just trying to give you inexhaustible knowledge and biblical proof of the roles of these distinctive leadership offices in the Lord's church uh, that we all may uh, not only know, uh, but function in the, uh, <clears throat> under the umbrella God has given us, and that the members can valuably treat those who serve amongst us. Last week, we talked about the role of the minister, his identity, his identity. But tonight, that segues us into his image, the role of the minister. Let's deal with the man of God's image. We'll be dealing with several metaphors tonight that describe uh, the man of God that the scripture uses as allegories and analogy and metaphors uh, with uh things that people knew then and now that may help us better to understand the image of the minister, the man of God. Uh, the first thing you would have put under that umbrella tonight, and there are several things we'll deal with, is he's a teacher, the man of God, the minister. His job is a teacher. You know he's a preacher, but he's also a teacher. Uh, the valuable preacher also is a really good teacher. See, there's a distinct difference between preaching and teaching. We preach to proclaim, but we teach to explain. And there is a lot of value in preaching. It is God's chosen met methodology for saving the world. But really good preachers can also be good, also find themselves being good teachers, explaining not just proclaiming, because on Sunday when you proclaim the word, uh, there's no exchange, there's no Q&A, there is uh, little uh, answer to questions. When you teach, though, you give an explanation uh, along with the proclamation. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 2, he said to Timotheus, his young protege and his young uh, follower, and the young preacher in the first century, he said, commit the things I taught you, Timothy, commit these things to faithful men who shall teach others also. A really good teacher, a preacher, has generational influence. He learns, he teaches, and those he taught will eventually end up teaching. I've lived long enough, and I think this is what Paul was trying to convey in the text of 2 Timothy 2 and 2. And I shared this with you with the likes of Moses and McDuffie. Uh, you live long enough, you baptize people, you marry them, you see their children grow up, you teach them, they then subsequently teach others. It's generational. It's like old enough to be a grandfather like I am, a papa. I taught my son and my daughter, and they teach their children uh, what I taught them and what I learned from my own mother and father. And so... Uh, the, his image, the man of God, the minister, he's a teacher. He multiplies the gospel. He, he, he expands the sphere of his influence. He duplicates workers in the kingdom. Uh, it plants the seed that others may grow thereby. 
Uh, you recreate, you reproduce. That's the value, the role, the image of the minister. Uh, for that to happen, he's got to be diligent in scriptures. I'm explaining all this to you. So, I, you know, uh, I'm probably on the downside of the mountain. But for those out there listening, you're looking for a preacher or thinking about getting a preacher. Or if you want to be a preacher, you can learn uh, in a more profound way what God expects and what people ought to require of you. You have to be diligent in the scriptures. That means steady, true, and loyal to the word. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 16, From a child thou hast known the holy scripture, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. Uh, the earlier you learn and uh, you're diligent and steady, it is great. Uh, uh, makes a great man of God, a minister of God, an evangelist, and a preacher. His role as a teacher. 2 Timothy 2.15, you remember what Paul said? Steady to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, who rightly divides the word of truth. Your steady keeps you in a position, and the church in a position, where the man of God can disseminate information correctly. He can rightly divide the word of God. Anybody can divide it, but Paul says, no, you ought to rightly divide it. Truth be told, you can make the Bible say about anything you want it to say. But that's why you have to be steady or train or learn it that you can not only divide the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Dispensation, New Dispensation, uh, you, you learn Old Testament church, uh, 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 tribes, New Testament church, Old Testament um, law, New Testament baptism. They're things you better know and be able to teach rightly as a man of God. He must be solid in the scripture, full devotion in the Bible, 2 Timothy 2 and 3. Uh, he must then also learn from 2 Timothy 2 and 3. Uh, he must accept hardship and suffering. As a matter of fact, that's the text of Paul told Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of the man of God, the minister, the evangelist, the preacher, is to gain favor and approval from Christ himself. You may suffer from some men. You may be criticized, marginalized, ostracized, demonized. But our goal has to be and always should be to gain approval from Christ. You know what else is amongst the imagery of the uh, minister? Uh, Paul used a metaphor. Not only is he a teacher, he's an athlete. Second Timothy 2 and 5. He's strong. He's self-motivated. Paul said he uh, compares him to an athlete, well-trained uh, uh, proficient and efficient in his profession. Uh, like the athlete must train daily and diet with regimentation and uh, home his craft. The same thing for the man of God. There's no room for lazy people in this discipline. You know what else Paul said? He's like a farmer. A farmer. Uh, they, of course, lived in an uh, Algerian culture then. In 2 Timothy 2 and 6, Paul says that the preacher, the evangelist, the minister should plant and reap. He should nurture and fertilize. And he ought to be a partaker of uh, the fruit that he plants. Yes, he's a teacher. This is his image. Yes, he's an athlete, a chiseled, trained uh, professional who uh, daily uh, keeps up a regimentation that keeps him fit and focused and uh, dependable and reliable and reduplicates what he studied. Uh, these things are amongst the image that the man of God must project and must keep amongst the people. Um, and then Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, he's a workman. Who needeth not be ashamed. We just read that. 
rightly dividing the word of truth. A workman, that just means he's a man that works. <laughs> we don't have enough of that in today's society in 2023. Uh, we had a lot of workmen when I came along. Uh, that was a man who works. Not just a preacher, but all men, all uh, uh, males, all leaders, all husbands, all brothers in the church ought to be workmen. The man of God must be, the preacher must be the chief example of work going on. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to assess things sometimes, but I do want to, you're not going to uh, probably call me lazy. There's a lot of things you can call me. And you might even be accurate, but lazy ain't amongst them. Because the one thing I do know, churches don't grow and people are not edified and God is not glorified when there's lazy men or brethren not fulfilling the mandate to be a workman. So Paul commands Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, be a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes. He is a workman that's accountable to God and accessible to the people, according to 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 5. Yes, again, he, the workman, the preacher, the minister, the, the evangelist is accountable to God and must always be accessible to the people. You know what else he is, and this is not a long lesson tonight, but a strong lesson. He is a vessel. He's a vessel. He's a reservoir uh, for God. Uh, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. Uh, a vessel is so important in the Old Testament. We, we, we use it more for decor now, vessels and pots. Uh, but back then, the vessel was to hold precious goods and commodities. Something valuable was placed in a vessel. Gold and silver and jewelry and those things. Uh, the vessel kept that expensive perfume that they anointed the Lord's feet, spinknar. When the woman took and broke that vessel or that vase and took her hair, her long hair, and washed and anointed the Lord's feet. See, vessels were containers not just for beauty uh, sake, but they were to hold valuable commodity. And so Paul uses that metaphor that the man of God holds the word of God. And he uh, devies it out and disseminates it. This valuable commodity God has entrusted him with. He's a vessel. He's a tool of God. He's the man of God. He gives the people of God the information that he got from God. And so it is important that you take care of this vessel because God puts uh, his word and his spirit in this vessel so you can give it to other homo sapiens, uh, other vessels of clay. Uh, uh, Paul uh, said to the Corinthian church, he's given this treasure, the gospel, in earthen vessels. Uh, and so uh, we must be careful and stress the importance of being people who respect the vessel that God uses. Uh, I, I've gone to places, thank God I don't preach at a place, uh, that abuse the vessel of God and then wonder why the church does not grow. No, you cannot mistreat what God loves and sanctions and ordains, you, you can't mistreat that and then expect, expect God to bless you or bless that. And so uh, there's a scripture we've been abusing for years. It is in Galatians uh, chapter 6 where uh, Paul says in verse 9 and 10, you shall uh, reap what you sow. And so we've often used that to lambast people. You're doing wrong, you're doing sin, you're in transgression, and you're going to reap what you sow. But the full text of the, that scripture, if you to read it accurately, rightly divided, Paul started talking about how you treat the preacher. If you, 
if you mistreat the preacher, or if you abuse your preacher, other man of God, he says in verse 10, that, or verse 9, that we love to create, uh, quote, he says, then you shall reap what you sow. If you sow into the man of God, you will get back much fruit and spiritual nourishment from the man of God. You shall reap what you sow. He really was talking about the preacher, the man of God. Just go back and read the entirety of the text. Uh, and you'll see that so because that vessel is important. That's why we appreciate and applaud our elders. We appreciate and applaud our deacons. Uh, even, uh, you know, they appreciate and applaud me constantly, perpetually. And there are people that have a problem with that. And that's just your problem. You get over it or you won't. Uh, but it ain't my problem. Your problems ain't my problems. The Bible says if you take care of the vessel, the vessel will take care of you. And, and we have to learn that concept in the church. You gotta learn that in marriage. You gotta learn that in relationships. You take care of that which take care of you. You feed that which feeds you. You help people who help you. You comfort people who comforted you. It just makes good sense, not only biblically correct, it's pragmatic in nature. So not only, beloved, and the metaphors that Paul used to describe his image, a night, the man of God, the minister, the evangelist, the preacher. He's a teacher. Uh, Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, verse number 2, he's an athlete, chiseled and trained and regimented and, and always uh, perfecting his craft. He's a farmer, according to 2 Timothy 2 and 6, that plants seed and harvest it and ought to partake of what he planted. Uh, he's a workman. He's a man that works. Lord, stay away from lazy preachers. Sisters, stay away from lazy men. You see he's lazy. You see he don't want to work. I know men, just, they just don't want to work. If they're forced to, they might. They'll work long enough to get a paycheck or two. And then they're looking for a way not to work. Real men look for ways to work. And so the preacher, he says, one of his imagery, according to Second to Timothy 2.15, he's a workman who need not be ashamed. Then we just talk about he's a vessel. He's a container. He's a reservoir. He holds the word of God and the spirit of God. And his job is to simulate that which God has given him. And that's why the preacher has to go off and be trained. He goes to lectureships and seminars and workshops. Our church has always been good and benevolent with that. You, you, you have to get uh, continuing education. Uh, you have to stay on the cutting edge. And so you, uh, you go off to different conferences. I'm a member now of four different boards in the Church of Christ and uh, being now licensed as a Christian counselor, uh, I go to that workshop. I think it's this year in Memphis because the more you learn as a man of God, the more you can teach the people of God. Hear me and hear me well. The more you learn as a man of God, the better able you to teach the people of God. Last but not leastly tonight, under the image of the role of the minister, he's a bond servant. Uh, he's a slave or servant to Christ. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 24. Uh, he says, Paul says, he doesn't strive with the people. He's not always fighting the people. He's uh, positive with the people. Uh, because what happens is he's not under his own direction. He's not his own boss. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul said to the church at Ephesus, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Prisoners don't get to do what they want to do. Prisoners do what they're told to do by the warden or those in charge. So the man of God belongs to God. The man of God is an employee of God. And the man of God is a steward for God. The man of God is a prisoner of God. A steward does not manage his own affairs. A steward manages the affairs of others. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. Last week we talked about his identity, the preacher. This week we talk about his image. Uh, and next week we'll talk about his involvement. Yes, I wanna give a wealth of information inexhaustible wealth of information that we can uh, log into our uh, cerebellum for years to come 
explaining and scripturally defining the role of our leaders, the elders, the preacher, and the deacons. So yes, he's a teacher, he's an athlete. These are metaphors not I came up with, but Paul came up with. Teacher, athlete, farmer, workman, vessel, and bond servant. God bless you tonight. Let us pray together. Father, we're mindful, glad, and happy of this opportunity we share like faith, talking about the role of the minister, his image, uh, the comparisons and the metaphors Paul used to better describe what a preacher is and ought be. Help me and others who've been called into the ministry to live up uh, to the vocation where we've been called. We pray for the members of the church to appreciate the labor not only of the preacher and the minister, but the elders and the shepherds and the deacons who work so interfatigably amongst us. Bless us at Southside. Bless our least to the greatest, the sick to the well. Those are dealing with things that are unimaginable and unconscionable. Bless them, keep them, help us to love each other and forgive each other like you, for Christ's sake, have forgiven us. This is our prayer tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to pray for our successful last leaders this weekend. Our children have been working very diligently to represent us well. Praying for Trevor uh, and Melanie Williams. They've been leading us and Cheryl Kravis and Kim Adams. Highly appreciative of their efforts. And there are a few more. I don't want to forget their names, but you've been very valuable and we highly appreciate you. I want to remind you again, too, uh, we need the information. Give it to Melanie Williams of the students who are on the A, uh, B honor roll or the all A honor roll. We want to do our annual recognition real soon. We've not done that for the last year or two because of COVID. Uh, the kids were at home learning. We did not want to disadvantage anybody who was not a good home learner. So we just didn't do it. But now we're back to a sense of normalcy. And if your kid, your child is on the a honor roll or the AB honor roll, please submit that information to Melanie Williams. We'll be recognizing them again real soon. Also, if your child is graduating high school or college, if you're a college graduate, let us know. Uh, if you have a child who's a high school graduate, uh, please, ma'am. I know Jackson Tobit is graduating. I think Layla Richardson is graduating. Uh, I'm looking for more names. We want to celebrate all of you. You're very important to us. And uh, please govern yourself accordingly. This Sunday, oh, it's Dunamis Sunday, Power Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday. What a time to come back to worship. Easter Sunday, be there. I'm going to preach a sermon called A Surprise at the Cemetery. That's what resurrection is. It's a surprise at the cemetery. And so be there in person, uh, 10 a.m., for Sunday school, 11 a.m. for worship. If you cannot make worship in person, please watch it via of all of our social mediums. God bless you. God keep you. Thank you again for being so attentive if we talked about the image as being a part of the role of the minister. Good night and be blessed.